I'm here today with Rick Peacock Edwards, who's written a book uh, all about the NAT, the fallen NAT as flown by the Royal Air Force and other Air Forces called the NAT Boys. And we're going to talk to him about that and other subjects. But Rick, I'm dying to mention to everyone that you saved my flying career. But for our <laughs> listeners, I wonder if you could give us a potted history, perhaps, of your time in the Air Force. Yeah. Well, the first thing is I'm, I'm the son of a Battle of Britain pilot. So wow. flying was in the blood. But I grew up in South Africa and actually joined the RAF from South Africa. They shipped me across. And um, I was too old to go to Cranwell at the time, so I went the other route. Um, straight into flying training, basically, um, on the Jet Provost and then advanced flying training on the NAT. And then um, did my sort of tactical weapon training on the Hunter. Um, and then onto the Lightning, which was my dream aircraft. Wow. And uh, I had two tours on the Lightning, one in Germany on 92 Squadron, and then one back at Coldershaw, training those going to Germany, basically, on 65 Squadron. And then I went kicking and screaming into the uh, training world um, to become a, went to uh, Little Rissington and Campbell to become a, a qualified flying instructor on the NAT. Uh, and then I went back to Valley, um, this time as an instructor, where I had a really thoroughly enjoyable time. I got over a thousand hours on, on that. In fact, I've got a th over a thousand hours on quite a few aircraft. And, um, and then after that, then I went to the Phantom, where we met at uh, Lucas, uh, where we met before that, but saw each other again at Lucas okay. on uh, uh, different squadrons. I know which was the best one, so do you, but there <laughs> we are. <laughs> um, and uh, then the rest of my flying career sort of partly oscillated around short ground tours, mainly in London and one in Washington. But uh, I moved on to the Tornado and I was the very first RAF pilot to um, fly the fighter version of the Tornado and I had the job of forming the first squadron and introducing the aircraft into RAF service. And then that was a long association with the Tornado, both um, as uh, commander of 65 Squadron, which was also the operational conversion unit at Coningsby. Um, and then a little while later, I commanded the Tornado base at Leeming with three squadrons, um, from where I was the first commander actually in, in, in the build up to the Gulf War out in um, Saudi Arabia. Um, and then at the end of that tour, I thought, well, my flying days are over. And I went off to Washington into the British Embassy as an air attaché. Um, but then I got promoted and came back as the RAF's Inspector of Flight Safety, where I flew absolutely everything. Um, I had to stay current on um, quite a few types. At least one was operational, so I went back to the Tornado again. So I had a great tour there, um, basically sort of floating around the Air Force, um, I had responsibility for the whole Air Force, flew everything and met everyone, and it was a great experience. Then my final uh, job in the Air Force was director of Ty Eurofighter Typhoon, so I was a fighter boy really from start to finish. And uh, I retired uh, from the Air Force with over 7,000 flying hours, um, 1,500 hours on the Lightning, 1,000 on the Nat, 1,000 on the Phantom, and over 1,000 on the Tornado, and a lot of other things too. And then, so that was my Air Force career. And in a nutshell, outside that, I've, I've had also quite an exciting and interesting career in the outside world as well. But I think it's the flying career in the Air Force that you're more interested in. Well, we are very interested in that. And that is a remarkable uh, amount of flying and a fantastic uh, time in the Air Force. So congratulations. Uh, I found the book, Nat Boys, which you wrote along with Tom Eels, a delightful read, both as a historic record of a remarkable little jet uh, and as a wonderful collection of anecdotes. Um, who do you imagine will be your target audience for the book? Well, the target audience, um, as far as I'm concerned, we're concerned, is any aviation enthusiast, but obviously the the target audience that we've got from the start are all those who were involved with the NAT, who flew it, whether it was in the UK um, at Valley instructing or with the Red Arrows or um, overseas in India um, or Finland. or And then, of course, the NATs are still flying today. So in the book, as you've seen, we come right up to date. We, we go from the start to where we are now. And it really was, well, it was a very satisfying um, piece of work that we did there, and I can explain more about how that happened. 
Mm, absolutely, we'd love to hear that. Yeah, I'm in touch with a, a, a group of guys in New Zealand who are yep. trying to bring uh, a gnat back into flying condition out there, which is fantastic. Interestingly, the NAT only stayed in service with the RAF for 16 years, which is quite a short time, say, compared with the Hawker Hunter, which flew in the same year but carried on with the Air Force for nearly 40 years, and in other countries for 60 years. Indeed, the NAT's replacement, the BAE Hawk, still going strong 48 years later. Why was the NAT's life uh, so short? Um, in my view, it was because uh, the, the NAT was just a beautiful aircraft to fly, in my view. It was a perfect uh, leading trainer for aircraft like the Lightning. Um, it, uh, as you would have seen from the book, all those who contributed, the one thing that comes out, one of the things that comes out to me is that everybody who, who flew the NAT loved flying it. It's a little pocket rocket. It's a sports car of the skies, basically. And I certainly love flying it. Um, but. There were things in the net. If, if, you, if you didn't know what you were doing with the aircraft, it could kill you very quickly. And the accident record of the net um, was not that great, in fact. And I think probably it's the accident rate, plus a lot of people thought it was pretty complex. It was complex. The control system was very complex. And that was one of the areas that would kill you. Um, so I think you know, a decision was made fairly, fairly early on that they needed to move forward. And of course, and the Hawk came along, and the Hawk has done a fantastic job since. But those of us who were fortunate enough to fly the Nat um, absolutely loved it. Of course, in saying that, we never forget those that we knew who died in accidents. Um, they would never be forgotten. No, you're quite right there. Now, when the Nat was uh, first envisaged by Folland, it was suggested it might be the answer to Europe's air defence problem, which was a pretty bold statement. Was it? genuinely a practical solution? No, no, not, not in my view. I mean, we did some interesting things with the NAT. It, was, it, it proved itself as a very effective fighter in the uh, Indo-Pakistani wars, where the Indians loved it, and it was known as the Sabre Slayer. And there, that's where the, the fighter experience ca um, comes from, uh, plus Finland flew it as a fighter as well. Um, but um, really, I mean, it, it's a very you put the NAT on, it's a, it's a small aircraft, it's lightweight, it doesn't have the sort of uh, um, capability to carry much weaponry. Um, it doesn't have a radar, for example, you know, where are you going to put a radar in it? So it, it's got a role in, in the fighter world. Um, you know, in the Air Force we used to use mixed fighter force operations, so tag, tag a NAT onto a Phantom or a, or a Tornado or something like that and, and it can be used very effectively. But the answer to Europe's um, prayer, no. Um, the uh, RAF's trainer version, the T1, uh, I always found, found the integrated flight instrument system that it came with a delight to use. Um, but its acceptance as a common system throughout the RAF kind of failed, really, uh, since it only ever appeared in the Lightning and the Buccaneer. Now, why was that? I really don't know, because all I can say is that um, I agree with you totally. The um, um, the OR nine four six uh, instrument integrated system in the NAT was a beautiful system for instrument flying, quite frankly, and we had it in the Lightning, and as we as you said, and it was that's one of the reasons why it was such a good leading trainer to aircraft like the Lightning, because we used all these things. We, we got used to speed, we got used to the instrumentation. It wasn't just the uh, all that, but things like the instrument landing system as well, and doing auto ILSs, which we, the NAT, you could do some very advanced things in. Um, I really don't know why it um, wasn't used in more aircraft around the Air Force, because there's no doubt about it, in my view, it was, in many ways, ahead of its time, at, at the time. It was a good system. It was, it was, and a delight to fly with. Mm. Um, now, when the NAT was accepted as the RAF's fast jet trainer. It had been in competition with the T-7 Hunter, which most of us then flew prior to the tank weapons course. Now, the T-7 was a side-by-side -side cockpit. Mm. The um, NAT, of course, was um, um, I don't know, like tandem. a tandem, like a bicycle. Yeah. Um, do you think that was a factor in why it was chosen? Yes, I do. I mean, it, 
I, I think it was the right choice. I, I found the tandem, I, I just found the Nat just an absolute delight to fly. And the tandem said, personally as a, as a student, the instructor and the student relationship was, was very good and you know, the instructor in the back, the view from the back wasn't that great, but um, you could certainly sort of, it was, it was good for sort of uh, instructing. And for, I found as a student, when I was a student there, it was nice being in my own cockpit. And when I was an instructor, I didn't find it was a hindrance not to have the student in the same part of the aircraft as me. I knew exactly what, what he was doing. I could monitor it. Whereas the Hunter, the T7, anybody you flew the Hunter, the T7 was the two-seater, which was, and then you had the F6, which was a single-seater. And you, you know the difference between the two-seater and the single-seater. On, It didn't have the same power for a start. And not only that, but it was a lookout, you know, side by side. It was a bit of a cumbersome thing. It was a nice thing to fly, but nothing like the Nat. No, no you're quite right. An awful lot of iron work around that yeah. cockpit. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, the Nat was considered a very challenging aircraft for less able students to fly. Now, do you feel that was an advantage, considering the generation of fast jets that they were likely to move on to, despite the trainer's safety record? What I will say is that anybody who got through the NAT course had earned the right to go forward into the uh, fast jet OCU world. It was demanding. I think for the lesser able students, it was particularly demanding. Um, speed, I mean, as with the Lightning, in fact, it was one of those aircraft, you come from the Jet Provost onto the NAT and it's a quantum leap forward. And it, you can read it in the book, the number of people, so when they first flew the Nat, they thought, wow, how am I ever gonna fly this? But they do, they, they settle down and they, and they love it. Um, but um, there's always some um, who, the things that catch people out are mental capacity, um, ability to cope under pressure. Um, and it does, you know, flying the aircraft it's the, only, the NAT is the only aircraft that I've always said that I've had to fly it on the runway as well as in the air. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Well, there's a lot of truth in that statement. Yeah, that, that really narrow undercarriage. Narrow undercarriage base. And, the, uh, and the wings. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in, in, on a wet runway um, in a crosswind, the air, well, the air, it was not so bad on takeoff, you, except you had to have the right amount of aileron into, into wind to keep the wings level. But on landing, it can be a real, real bugger, quite frankly, because <laughs> it would it would rock and roll down the runway. <laughs> Absolutely, yes, I, I remember doing that myself. I, I read with amusement Derek Bryant's story uh, as the Central Flying School uh, NAP project officer and one of the very first uh, RAF NAP pilots who, after twenty five flights, mishandled the aircraft on takeoff and wrecked the undercarriage. Yeah. Now. Yet this was an aircraft that students were supposed to be able to learn on. Do you think that was a, a lesson in itself? It was a lesson and, and they learned from it. And uh, uh, Derek Bryant sort of was very upfront about, mm -hmm. you know, sort of what had happened. He was the, he had the job, rather like I did years later, to introduce the tornado into service. He introduced the that into service. And I think in many ways it's fortunate that happened because they, they learned from that. Uh, they they uh, introduced modifications as a result which can only have helped in the future. Absolutely, yeah. Now, another um, marvelous bit in the book, I love Mike Shaw's poker player's description <laughs> of the uh, RF Valley's hangers when he says, a full house, gnats on jacks. But it had the kind of ring of truth about it, didn't it? So why was the gnat so often in the hangar instead of flying? Well, it was a complex aircraft, I mean, I mean, <laughs> the Jet Provost was a clockwork mouse, basically, compared with the Nat. Mind you, the Nat, compared with the Lightning, the Lightning hangers looked fairly, <laughs> fairly interesting as well. But um, it went, serviceability was a problem, particularly Mike Shaw was on, I think, he was on the very first course, in fact. So the aircraft engineers come in, um, and they did have big service, serviceability problems then. They overcame a lot of those, certainly when I was flying the Nat, some years later, we had loads of gnats on the line, but not in Mike's day. So it was, it, was, it was the complexity of the aircraft. Complexity of the aircraft and the fact that it was new and to some extent the lack of spares at the time as well.